They again left what worked in place, merely beefing up my processing power to handle the data stream from a mass of hypersensitive chemo sensors lining the nostril and adding connections to several portions of the brain and endocrine system. The greater the breadth of senses that the RFP requires, the more intelligent and self-aware it becomes. This is inherently problematic, since, as Robin Chalco knows regarding blindness, people without certain senses are often viewed as less complete and less intelligent even than the able-bodied majority. He states, blindness is often understood as a problem of knowing insofar as knowledge is understood as bringing sense perception. If we possess our senses in natural working order, we possess knowledge. A glance at any current introductory psychology text shows the modern understanding that most of what we know is comes through the, what most of what we know comes through our senses. And it shows that most of that knowing comes from the sense of sight. This conception of knowledge and knowing sets up an obvious connection. The less we see, the less we know. I should mention here that Rod is uh, a blind person himself, so he's talking about the, cost, uh, the reflection of his own body from other people. This perception of absence and associated yes. perception of ignorance is implicit within our cultural use of sensory metaphors for intelligence, such as, he was blind to the implications, or he turned a deaf ear to the issue. This link is made clearly when the RRP states, as the notes of the cook, I reached my pinnacle of intelligence. The RRP is integrated with the notion of ensuring distance from the biological by being integrated as the left foot of the with the capacity to see, but without interacting with the host brain. The RRP begins its digital life uh, as a figure that is made to be independent and only to separate it from the biological host and reinforce the artificial barrier between the setting and the body. For a little tweak my silicone, the processor now had sensory input and made reflex decisions on the consequence of movement without bothering that cognition going on upstairs. The eye is made so that it will not interfere with the body's own cognition, but that requires it to have an independent cognition. As the RRP suggests, quote, in other words, the son was smart enough to know his old man would not be in favor of being bossed by his buttons. So the left foot acquired some subtlety along with the annoying calluses on its heel. This need for subtlety and hiding on the part of the RRP, particularly where it pertains to cognition, reinforces the Cartesian dichotomy endemic to our society. The blind man is not concerned with the idea of adding a foot to his body that emulates his bodily processes, but he is uncomfortable with the idea of appendage that interferes with his cognition, particularly one that relates to senses. The prosthetic is considered adaptable only insofar as it relates to biological functions that are separate from cognition, creating an artificial barrier between mental self and biological or biotechnical body. The prosthesis is constructed here as something that is both part of and separate from the body, integrated yet distant, distinct yet interdependent. It's integrated in such a way that it can be viewed as independent from the body, thus preserving the user's notion of independence as well. One of the fears of using accommodation technology is the notion of losing independence and becoming dependent upon that accommodation, which is constructed in our neoliberal society with its hyper focus on the idea of independence as part of that general apparatus of freedom to decide. It's constructed as weak. In a system that relies upon a divided notion of economic independence and the constructions of bodily normalcy, and which sees the disabled body as a drain on resources, the notion of bodily accommodation is seen to imply a body that is unable to be independent. The prosthesis, therefore, represents an uncertainty in terms of our social constructions of independence, particularly where it interacts with the brain, which we construct as the center of independence, pretending to be a freedom of thought in a system of bodily control. The implications of the hybrid consciousness become even more uncomfortable with the notion of independent selfhood when technological accommodations interact with human cognition. The senses are seen as particularly linked to ideas of consciousness, making an artificial life form to experience the sensory data particularly threatening to the notion of a separate human consciousness. When a foot with an eye in it, the RRP has a separate consciousness that maintains a separate processing as it is integrated into other parts of the body, representing a filtering of the senses before it connects with the mind of its host. This filtering provides discomfort for the host, 
and triggers the desire to be disintegrated from the cybernetic body part. The blind man cuts off his foot due to his discomfort with the idea of being controlled by the prosthesis. He first attempts to express his concerns about his foot, but when he visits the psychiatrist, his body knowledge is entirely ignored, and he decides that his only recourse is to cut off his foot um, to preserve his own bodily integrity, particularly since he's sort of wandering away from what he's on the foot. When the RRP is integrated into the arm of a bricklayer, it expresses its own dislike for its hybrid status and the interference with its own cognition. Quote, regrettably, there is a limit to how far I can improve his performance before others, biological components, begin interfering. Beginning with the tattoo incident, the RRP learns how to tap its host nervous system and shut down the host's body. When the RRP becomes a nose chef, it's more completely integrated into that neuronal structure of the human body and ultimately discovers that it can actually hack that human consciousness and assume perfect control over it. Quote, I had access to a physical sensations, not that they were remotely interesting once the novelty wore off, but I was prepared to be open-minded. I craved input. This craving for input, the desire for sensory data, meant the RRP began hacking into the host's body, overriding her cognition in order to open itself to the extensive sensory experience. Senses for the RRP became both a, meaning, a means for adding to its own cognition, but also simultaneously an addiction. Well, you see, with the enhancements, I've entered an entirely new realm of cognition. I could think in new ways I'd never been able to before. And it wasn't only what the text had added to me. The cook's long-term memory storage areas, no flesh, were at my disposal as part of her olfactory system. Being grossly underused, I saw no reason uh, not to add them to my own. Seeing the human body is limited, the RRP hacked the human body system for its own development of identity, absorbing the cook's memory uh, to provide itself with a greater link to personhood. Not only are the senses here linked to knowledge, but are systemically linked to identity, suggesting that the person who is lacking senses is vulnerable, open to manipulation, and ultimately a permeable body. Although Trinita is here raising an issue around the sense of the human when augmented with technology, this also opens up questions as to the definition of selfhood and the disabled body. Society generally sees disability as somehow belonging more to the disabled body and see the disabled body as a transmogrification of mistakes. Disabled people are treated as though they are fundamentally defined by their disability, and normative body people will generally attribute most concerns of a disabled individual with their disability, seeing it as a central feature of their definition. Tanya Tchikovsky, when discussing the reactions of people around her husband who is blind, notes that people tend to treat everything that occurs to him as related specifically to his disability. As Pichkosi suggests, it's called a mistake, an accident, or lack of attention when non-disabled people perform, fail to perform the set of background experiences that organize life. When non-disabled people do not adhere to disorder, we make sense of it by saying that something has gone wrong, or the person has done something wrong. Yet in the face of disability, there's often a slippage between the meanings of such actions and the meanings of the person. The actions uh, and every identity of the disabled person is socially constructed in the imagination of something intrinsically related to his or her disability. The direct link between disability and the disabled mind is a cultural artifact that has social power behind it. When the RRP in Trinata's story therefore uses the dis disability of the cook, her missing nose, to hack into the disabled body's consciousness, it replicates that notion that identity and selfhood are intrinsically connected to the disabled to the person's disability. The disability permeates, uh, sorry, provides a permeable space in the disabled body for the robotic appendage to take advantage of. Trinata examines the idea of social fear around our senses and the perceived manipulation of our senses as directly impacting on our person, <coughs> representing a vulnerability both of body and of identity. As the RRP suggests, you see olfaction as a primary sense and opened up whole new ideas. The senses are seen as constructive of identity and selfhood. This is also perhaps why the man who is given a left foot with an eye is resistant to replace his eyes. As an artist, he sees uh, his eyes as being particularly linked to his art as constitutive 
of his artistic vision. If he is looking out of someone else's eyes, it would alter the way he sees his art, ultimately fearing that the aesthetic senses would be irreparably damaged by seeing through the artificial instead of through the natural. He demonstrates a fear of losing something <coughs> integral to himself by losing his vision. Tchaikovsky examines the cultural link between sight and the natural, and the notion of authenticity when she says, quote, sight remains linguistic, and that we say that seeing is believing, or that knowledge is sight. Sight and knowledge are inexorably linked to able-bodied consciousness, so much that we regularly speak as if one represents the other. Therefore, when the blind man in Trinidad's narrative fears replacing his eyes, it represents more than simply the fear of a literal change in an organ, but rather the loss of things like his creative vision, his way of seeing the world, and other phrases like that that are clearly linked, uh, clearly linked the artist's perspective in our imagination with sight. His eyes are deeply connected with this idea of his authentic self. Despite this, his son feels the need for him to see. He forces sight onto his father, allowing Trinidad to explore the fact that people with disabilities are often treated as incapable of making their own decisions. The blind man in the story, both an aged and disabled subject, is infantilized, as often occurs in treatment of people with disabilities in the aged population. The man's son and the associated doctors try to force him to acquire eyes to fix his blindness, but he refuses. With his refusal, the son tries to find another way to get around his father's wishes, and the medical community is complicit in that. What eye, they ask back. No one was sure about to go against the father's wishes and do an unregistered replacement. That sort of thing would cut short a career path big time. Unless you're talking about one of those shady basement clinics, but this was a class establishment. Instead, they saw the eye in the man's left foot as a way of kicking around the ethics of permission and having uh, behaving in a way that they consider to be in the patient's best interest. Trinita explored the medical community and family's complicity in asserting control over the disabled subject and the social apparatus that allows people to override the disabled person's wishes if it is believed to be in their best interest. Engaging with the notion that people with disabilities are less capable of making decisions about their own bodies. Yet the old man has his own body knowledge, which is why he resists the RFP leg's assertion of itself against his wishes. Trinita gives the disabled subject agency in his assessment of his body, despite the social and medical pressure to submit to medical change. Disability is often seen as a representation of vulnerability, the construction of a weaker, more open body, and is generally socially constructed as the opposite of ability. This can be seen in the name itself, disability, literally negation of ability, the opposite. The RRP in this story is restrained as exploiting that fundamental vulnerability by using its body knowledge to hack the disabled subject. Yet, this text also tries to react against the notion of the disabled body as vulnerable by putting the disabled subject in the role of active agents in assessing the technology attached to the bodies and resisting the RRP's control. Trinata portrays both disabled subject and accommodation technology as completely individuals threatened by the mutual engagement and inter invasion of external consciousnesses. She explores the notion that in current society, through the course of the the future, disability is viewed as an essential incompleteness and as dependence. Instead, she portrays her characters as complete individuals who are resistant to interference or invasion and not dependent on their assistive technology or others. Instead, it's the RRP who is dependent on the disabled body. The disabled subject reacts to this intrusion of the RRP into their thoughts, but the RRP also views its own perceived incompleteness and dependence as a threat. Instead of exploring the disabled subject as someone who pines over their incompleteness, as someone uh, as sometimes occurs in able-bodied text featuring disability, she projects those concerns onto the RRP. It views its role as an appendage to another person as fundamentally demeaning and desires its own independence. Quote, it was demeaning. I was a genius, not just a note. <laughs> it exceeded every possible <laughs> expectation of my builders and surpassed the most cherished daydream of any tech involved in the manufacture and use. But I wasn't autonomous. 
I was imprisoned within this wall of wailing flesh. It was time. I saw clearly then to take charge. <laughs> Ideas of technology and disability are firmly interlinked in modernist ideologies, particularly linking medical technologies and the state of the body. Modernity tends to look at the advancement of medical technologies as having a capacity for greater assistance and accommodation for disabilities. But as Sidney Linton explores, quote, there are at least two competing ideas at work here. One is the belief that modern industrial world, sorry, in the, in the modern industrial world, scientific and technological competence would lead the way toward the highest level of care and of concern ever evidence. However, these modernist ideas mean that society would not tolerate being bogged down by those who can't keep up, who are thought to drain resources, or who remind us in any way of the limitation of our scientific capabilities. In both ideas, the use of efficiency prevails, leading to actions taken to contain the perceived negative social and economic impact of disability on society, even when bought with, altruistic, uh, with an altruistic facade. There are competing ideological issues that come along with technolog technological advances that further, that further alienate people with disabilities. As society becomes more technologically advanced, there are more opportunities for cybernetic, biomedical, and other assistive technologies. But social systems may persist in viewing the disabled body as a drag on the economy or an antithesis of efficiency. Technological development does not naturally signify a greater accommodation. Rather, accommodation must come with the social and ideological changes first that create a social system that is inclusive of bodily diversity or those technologies won't be made available to people with disabilities or will meet very limited situations, such as where someone has the economic means to purchase something. As Linton indicates, the horror that a technologically advanced society confronts when it sees something as it being unable to fix means that there will be a trend toward hiding those unfixable bodies. And this is already readily apparent in the social employment institutions where people with disabilities and the elderly are largely hidden from sight under the auspices of greater care, rather than working toward a form of integration. Similarly, even within our school systems, people with disabilities are isolated in various ways from the normative classroom uh, under the notion that they will slow down neurotypical or normative body subjects. But uh, both of these are aspects of a system that hides disabilities rather than integrating, and which uh, continues to isolate disabilities, particularly those that are unable to pass or play in as normal. Like any good text on disability, Trinado's bio digitex opens up questions that invite readers to explore their own discomforts with the notion of the body and the extent of that body in ontology.